Hello, and welcome to episode 15, all about the Mirror of Galadriel, chapter 7, book 2 of Fellowship of the Ring, being the 15th part of That's What I'm Talking About. My name is Mary Clay. If that's too complicated for you, just call me MC. And today I am joined by Caitlin of So You Want to Read Tolkien. Welcome, Caitlin. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I got really excited when I stumbled across y'all's podcast because I was like, oh my gosh, they're doing like the same thing I am going chapter by chapter, except they're doing it as huge lifelong fans and being able to go into depth about characters and and knowing what you know in the future and everything. And I was like, that's really awesome. I got to have at least one of them on. And so here you are. It's really great. I was really excited to discover your podcast because one of the motivators behind creating ours was that when I went to listen to Tolkien podcasts, there were none done by women. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to get two of my female friends and do a podcast together about it. So I was really excited to discover a new one out there done also by a woman. Yes. Who also didn't take it way too seriously, which most of the other podcasts out there take it super seriously. Oh, yes, 100%. And like, I'm not, well, and it's it's funny because I haven't been able to listen to any of those podcasts because I can't, like, you right. know, I'm afraid I'm going to get spoiled or something. I like sort of got spoiled on something. I was listening to a podcast called Gilmore Guys, and it's about two guys. Right, I know it. Oh, I love Gil- I love that so much. And I like re-listen yep. to their episodes all the time. Anyway, and there was one episode where they were talking about like how Return of the King ends and it has multiple endings or ambiguous endings or something. And I'm like, I don't, I was like, I'd never expected to be spoiled on Gilmore Guys, but here we are. So you never know with podcasts what's going to be. If they were talking about the movie, the ending of the books will be different (laughs) but sort of (laughs) yeah I and it's also awesome that hey it's Mary Clay from the future I don't know what happened here but my audio cut out briefly but what I'm about to say is that I'm excited to have a fellow female Tolkien podcaster on to talk about this chapter in particular because we get the introduction of Galadriel and I've just been waiting around for the introduction of an awesome female character and now I'm excited to talk about that And then here we are, several hundred pages in. So far, I don't know what it's like in The Hobbit, but so far in Fellowship of the Ring, we've had the Saxville Baggins woman. I don't even remember her name. It's like Loretta or something or Lita. I don't know. It starts with an L. Yeah. Oh, that's going to bother me me so much. She's the the Saxville Baggins who she takes over Bag End. um, And then she's also the one that Bilbo... That's it. Yes, that's it. Yeah. So we've met her. And then we've also met Goldberry, Tom Bombadil's eccentric fairy nymph wife. (laughs) And then several hundred pages later, we get Galadriel. So I'm really excited to be able to talk about this with another another woman podcaster and not that not that I'm not appreciative of my male guests, but it's just nice because, like, you get it. Yes, absolutely. And just so you know, if you're planning to do The Hobbit, don't don't hold your hopes for women oh, in oh, that there's... I have not been holding my breath at zero. all. literally <laughs> zero. That so. does not surprise me at all. Yeah, in my... I made a intro episode to kind of kick everything off and talk about what I know already and make some predictions. And one of my, like, biggest predictions that has already come true is that there's going to be very few female characters. And if there are any, they're only going to come in for, like, a short period of time um, mm-hmm. to aid or help in the quest at, you know, some level, and then they'll just be gone again. So... <laughs> I will give you hope that there is one lady who you have not yet met who is really awesome yes. and does some really awesome things. Yes. There's um, the one. <laughs> I And I know that there... Uh, it's really funny because I was using or someone sent me the gif of the woman taking like the helmet off and it says, I am no man. 
And, oh, I think it was Tyler, um, one of my producers, and he sent it. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, my gosh, I love that gift, but I have no idea what it's from. And he said, oh, that's ironic. So I'm assuming that is a character at some point in the Lord of the Rings movies. So I'm waiting for her to pop up. So we'll see. <laughs> um, no comment. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your like background or history connection with Lord of the Rings. I, I read the books. I read the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy when I was 13 or 14. And that was a couple years before the movies came out. And then I watched the movies and I've read the books a lot since then. I That's about it. I don't know. I, I don't really have like a story about it. I just like them. <laughs> That's a perfectly good reason. (laughs) Cool. Well, jumping in to this chapter, chapter seven, the mirror of Galadriel. And I have to like force myself to say Galadriel because in my head, when I read it, I read it as Galadriel. (laughs) And so I'm trying to fix my, it's just because I guess that's how like my brain is phonetically reading it and like connecting the letters to make a word. And so I'm still in the process of like making sure my brain is reading it and or say, pronouncing it correctly and trying to like fix how my brain reads it versus how I say it out loud. So don't come at me if I accidentally say Galadriel by mistake. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so excited to sound like the the knowledgeable one on this podcast. If you listen to us on our other on my other podcast, which we are very casual about and a lot of the times we drink while we record so just we forget how to say everything and we forget like we've literally gone chapter by chapter through the Silmarillion and then we forget all of it (laughs) and so it's, it's great to sound like the knowledgeable one for once yeah it's funny I have like before I'll start recording my guests will be like oh I'm nervous like what if I mess something up are people gonna like I'm like seriously you're on a podcast with someone who knows nothing I know as uh, I know up to chapter eight book two of Fellowship of the Ring so as long as like I like I'm here to make everyone else look really smart so don't worry about that (laughs) I like it also that sounds really fun doing like drunk history but drunk Cimmerillion history that sounds fun (laughs) yeah we after we went through the whole Cimmerillion we did an episode where we specifically got very drunk and tried to recap it from memory oh that's it was (laughs) a disaster but a good one I guess That's great. I can't wait to listen to it one day when I'm done with these books and the movies and everything. So, all right, cool. So this chapter uh, kicks off with them leaving this, uh, they were leaving the heart of the forest and kind of heading to the main city where the Lord and Lady are awaiting their arrival. And they arrive at a clearing where there are no trees and then they find the uh, I guess the city of Lorien it doesn't really the specific place isn't really named or anything is it the city the city is called Karis Galathon. yeah there it is I even highlighted it because I'm mm-hmm. my past self was smarter than my current self <laughs> I literally highlighted it welcome to Karis what did you say Galathon. Ga- the, Gal- the dh in elvish is always like a th oh my gosh that's so helpful <laughs> Yeah, because I've been this entire time. I'm like, okay, so it's here is the city of Galathrim. Is that it? Because the you said the DH is a th. Uh, which city are we talking about? Galathrim. It says yeah. It says uh like first part of the chapter. It says who is saying this? Halder is saying welcome to Karis Gal Galthorn. Here is the city of Gal Galathrim. Oh, oh oh yeah yeah Galathrim. Galathrim, yes, where, where dwell, dwell the yes. Lord of Celeborn and Galadriel, the Lady of Lorien. I was looking like one line above that at Galathon, <laughs> and I'm like, where is she getting this R from? I don't know. <laughs> but yes, yes, Galathrim. See, already you are very knowledgeable and helpful just with giving me the information that the D H is a th is is a th. God, I can't talk a th sound. So they enter the city, and it's basically like a massive tree fort city which i think is just like what every like eight-year-old wishes was in their backyard yeah uh i mean not if you don't like heights that is yeah the hobbits (laughs) yeah if you don't like heights this is like torture that is true but i think it sound it sounds like just so magical and fun and uh in the previous episode which as of 
the time of us recording hasn't come out yet, but in the previous episode, I just gushed about how beautiful and wonderful and marvelous this forest and, and everything sounds. And also just the way that Tolkien writes about it is gorgeous. And he, I feel like you can probably tell, I mean, I could be very wrong, but it almost feels like he's playing favorites with the people that he created or the races and it seems like his favorite is the elves just 100 percent. yeah just because of the way he describes them i think he also has a soft spot for hobbits but Mm -hmm. he does not give two cents about dwarves yeah oh poor dwarves which we'll uh we'll get into because it's well actually yeah, so in the previous chapter, we had our guest Amy was gave um, some very insightful thoughts that was really interesting for me to hear about knowing very little about the whole like dwarf elf beef that's going on um, mm-hmm. and having on- pretty much only the context of like, okay, something bad happened I- a long, long time ago and split them apart. And it's sa- so... I think, and you are under, like, no, like, if you don't remember exactly what happened or anything, don't worry about, like, having oh, to no, remember I, it Oh, no, I remember exactly what happened. Okay, cool. Yeah, so if I got it correctly, there was an elvish king, and then something happened where the dwarves, like, killed him and took a crown and then ran? Is that what happened? I feel like it was a necklace. Okay. It, but, it um, probably was. They stole yeah, something. So, but my thought on this is really that it was the elves' fault personally because this particular elvish king wasn't involved in any of the crap going on at the time and he, because of like a completely different story and being like a bad father basically got himself involved, which is why he had this necklace thing in the first place and he didn't he like, he took this curse upon himself for reasons that were stupid (laughs) and that's and that sort of you know bore fruit when him and the dwarves basically murdered each other but anyways it was all his fault (laughs) it's funny you say that because that was um amy's perspective on the previous episode as well um is that like the dwarves have done nothing wrong here just like calm down and put everything aside this was like hundreds of years ago at this point and or maybe thousands i don't know because oh thousands and thousands oh my gosh that's insane but it really the only thing i can think that like just reminds me of kind of what they're being like is the episode in avatar the last airbender where they're trying to cross the and if you haven't seen yeah. it no one no i know exactly what episode yeah you mean. where they're trying to like cross the canyon and then mm-hmm. there's like the two tribes or something or villages and they each had a huge problem with the other and they don't even remember what it was that they're arguing Mm -hmm. over or why it was that they or no it had something to do with like a magical orb and then ang made up a story about how no it was a game (laughs) right yes but anyway just uh, it just kind of like goes to show how like over hundreds of years well i guess in that instance it was only a hundred years but like so many years can pass by and the only thing that like you don't remember exactly incest the like ancestral history or whatever the thing that it doesn't pass on is like the truth of what happened or the hindsight or or you know anything like that the only thing that's passed on is that like there's this hatred that you must carry on for the rest of your life <laughs> except that's a little bit different with elves since they're immortal that is true that because, is true because like galadriel was literally alive then when that happened oh my gosh and she the the king the definitely don't remember his name but he was the king of Doriath and Galadriel lived in Doriath for a while that's crazy yeah so that so, yeah the elves are man so they I feel like they really should have no excuse man and I feel I feel bad because I I like like the elves so much just because of how honestly it's just because of how beautifully Tolkien writes them so <laughs> well another thing to keep in mind is that the the, the necklace it's called the Nauglamir it had a jewel in it it, it had one of the Silmarils in it and they basically acted very similarly to the way the ring acts and so it made people do stupid things things oh interesting cool and so the dwarves wanting it for themselves mm-hmm. wasn't even necessarily a hundred percent their fault yeah like anybody who got involved in 
certain ways at any rate with with the Silmarils got they 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 got <laughs> up. <laughs> it was not a good thing to do. Cool. That's like all very important information to know going yeah. forward. <laughs> so they arrive at it's so it's so cool. So um where the Lord and Lady are is like up in the highest part of the trees, I guess. And so they have to climb this really tall ladder and I don't know. I just yeah. like that that note that they say that like oh it says it's a long climb for those who are not accustomed to such stairs but you may rest upon the way so I just I don't know I like that this it's a kind of literal and um, figurative thing of like they are the most high of the people Mm -hmm. in Lorien of the elves because they are the lord and lady so yes they climb up and here we meet Celeborn and Galadriel am Mm -hmm. I first of all am I saying Celeborn correctly no (laughs) C's and Elvish are always hard, so it's Celeborn. Celeborn. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. (laughs) So Celeborn and Galadriel says, Very tall they were, and the lady no less tall than the lord. And they were grave and beautiful. They were clad wholly in white, and the hair of the lady was of deep gold, and the hair of Lord Celeborn was of silver, long, and bright. But no sign of age was upon them, unless it were in the depth of their eyes. For these were keen as lances in the starlight, and yet profound the wells of deep memory. So again, there's Tolkien being like, I love these people. <laughs> you want me to blow your mind about Galadriel? Go for it. She is older than the sun and the moon. That's so, that's so cool, because I think at the end of the... Let me flip, let me flip. At the yeah, like towards the end of the episode, uh, episode, but <laughs> towards the end of the chapter, she says she's talking about like morning and night, sea, the sun, the snow, all of these things. Man, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. I okay, so maybe you know. My question okay. is like, if elves are ageless and they are immortal, how do so we know that Legolas is the son of another elf that they mention when he walks in? How like how mm-hmm. do elves? like age like how do elves have kids and then the kids grow up if they're ageless and immortal okay that i don't know i assume (laughs) they just sort of reach adulthood and stay that way in the way of every fantastic fantasy immortal race of beings i don't know yeah that man i think all of the people i've asked that question have been like you know that's a great question i don't know so that'll be i guess i don't like my white whale of this it's like how do the elf kids grow up if they're immortal and ageless and don't age. (laughs) So, or maybe they just age. Maybe the elves as kids age really slowly. And then by the time they reach, I don't know. See, I don't know. I I, I just go down the, I just go down this like, thought path and I'm like I I just have to like get off of it completely or else I'm gonna like drive myself insane so they as they like enter one by one yes they say they say like welcome Frodo of the Shire welcome Aragorn son of Arathorn and then I love I love Gimli's entrance because in the previous mm-hmm. chapter they there was a lot of beef about the dwarf being in the elf forest with them and all this talk of you know, he can't be here or, okay, I guess he can be here, but we're going to blindfold him. And then, and then once they finally get to the heart of the forest is when they say, here, take off your blindfold. We are deeply sorry. And they kind of give this official, almost like a, a official, I don't know, blessing or peace offering or something. And that's continued in this chapter too. And Mm -hmm. um, it says, Welcome Gimli, son of Gloin. It is long indeed since we saw one of Durin's folk in Karas Galathorn. But today we have broken our long law. May it be a sign that though the world is now dark, better days are at hand and that friendship shall be renewed between our peoples. So that's just nice. I just like that. It kind of kicks off with another initiation offering of peace and like finally thousands of years later a recognition of like there are darker things at play here let's put all this aside for for the sake of that and i guess with the elves mostly leaving middle earth it's kind of their last chance to make you know to wrap things up Mm -hmm. like we've got this loose thread with the dwarves maybe we should just put that whole 
murder thing aside yeah. and be friends. And it's also kind of like, <laughs> it's almost like for nothing if they're leaving or anything, because it's like you apologize and then like the next day it's like, oh, well, they're not even in the same land as us anymore and they're leaving. So what does it matter? Because yeah. they're not here. So <laughs> so they all arrive and Celeborn notices that he knows that there were originally nine that set out, and right now there are only eight, and they ask what happened, and they give the sad news that Gandalf has died. Well, technically, <laughs> technically, Aragorn, they don't say that he died, they say. Aragorn says, Gandalf the Grey fell into shadow. He remained in Moria and did not escape. So, and they talk of, his, you know, the loss and everything, but technically I don't think they really say, oh, he's dead because I know one of the spoilers I know. I don't know. I don't even know if it is a spoiler, which I'll talk about later in this chapter, but I know that Gandalf comes back and I know that mm-hmm. he comes out back as Gandalf the White. So right. I don't know. I just think that's interesting. Um, I know it's probably it, the... Real reason is probably just that saying he fell into shadow is just like is like a prettier, fancier way of saying, oh, he died. I I do think Aragorn thinks he's dead. Mm -hmm. You know, I I, I, perhaps um, Tolkien was writing it that way, you know, in order to have like a hint in the writing. I'm not Mm -hmm. sure. But I do think Aragorn and the rest of the company believe that Gandalf is actually dead. Uh Yeah. uh, Oh, yeah. I totally think that, too. I think. Yeah, I think it was more of Tolkien writing it in a way to be, I don't know, he's like being ultra specific about the words that he's choosing, which is kind of, I mean, which is just what he does. He's very intentional about the words and and language that he uses. And so as they recount the tale of what happened and talk about what happened in Moria, they say, let's see. They're talking about the creature or whatever it was that attacked them. And it, and Aragorn says, An evil of the ancient world, it seemed, such as I have never seen before. It was both a shadow and a flame, strong and terrible. And then Legolas says, It was a Balrog of Morgoth. Mm-hmm. And isn't, isn't Morgoth like some, like the equivalent of like Satan or the like angel that fell or something like that yeah yeah i mean i think it's more useful to think of him as like sauron's dad (laughs) okay yeah so i was like okay i know morgoth is i I couldn't remember exactly what it was but i was like i know morgoth is not good so this is a creature that is very not good i i and i don't mean that like literally he didn't like father sauron but yeah oh no i got their relationship (laughs) okay great i didn't know i totally got you yeah Oh, yeah. So, like, just the fact that also Aragorn, who up until, like, the entire, like, first half of the book or up until they leave Rivendell has been very, like, he knows what's going on and what he's doing and what he's talking about. And so the fact that, and also when Gandalf is running, when they encounter this creature, Gandalf says, too, that, like, he doesn't know what this is. And the fact that Aragorn is saying, I've never seen anything, like, that's scary. So I guess it's only, you know, you, like, you have to have something that powerful t- to take down such a powerful character like Gandalf. Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's kind of like, well, he could have, like, beat him up, right? And then gotten away with it. Which is actually, which is kind of what um, Celeborn goes into. And he's like, that was Gandalf's fault. He shouldn't have done that, blah, blah, blah. But what's interesting is he says that... Had I known the dwarves had stirred up this evil in Moria again, and I was like, okay, come on, man. Literally one page before, you were just giving this, like, peace offering and, like, welcome, let's be friends now. And then now he goes and blames the dwarves again, which I guess old habits die hard. Yeah. And then homegirl Gladriel comes in, and she says she basically defends the the dwarves and yeah. is like it's not their fault they didn't do this and then she said if our folk had been exiled long and far from Lothlorien of who Galathrim even Celeborn the wise would pass nigh and would not wish to look upon their ancient home though it had become an abode of dragons dark is the water of these are all the dwarfish words that i don't know how to say so that's okay, whatever. Dark is the water of Kelid Zaram, and cold are the springs of Kibblnala, and fair were the many pillared halls of Khazad-dûm in elder days before the fall of mighty kings beneath the stone. So she's basically saying, like, if if something like that 
because Moria and all of this used to be really nice. She says it was, um, and fair were the many pillared halls. So she knows how important this was, this was to the dwarves and for them to watch that fall and not want to go back and like take it back under their command is it's exactly what the elves would have done too if something had happened to Lorien which I Mm -hmm. also I also would be like yeah if like because Lorien is like a beautiful beautiful place and I think a hundred percent too the elves would be like no this is our beautiful forest we want it back. Darkness yeah. shouldn't I, be in there. I also think it's, I mean, A, you can really like, you can hear that Gimli just is immediately in love with her. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. I also think it, it's an interesting moment because they don't, many times in this chapter, Tolkien talks about how the elves within Lothlorien don't speak anything but Elvish. And like, they won't even speak yeah. whatever the common tongue is that everyone speaks. But here's this bit where, you know, the queen reaches out and sp- says these words in, in Dwarvish to mm-hmm. him as like a nice coming together of their culture. Yeah, it says she looked upon Gimli who sat glowering and sad and she smiled. And the dwarf, hearing the names given in his own ancient tongue, looked up and met her eyes. And it seemed to him that he looked suddenly into the heart of an enemy and saw their love and understanding. Wonder came into his face and then he smiled and answered. Man, it's so man, just Galadriel is great. I think she should be ruling everything. Gandalf Mm -hmm. who? Let's have her be the leader of the fellowship. Let's do it that way. I think it would go so much better and smoother, but fine. Well, she's got other things to take care of. Yeah, which yeah, which we kind of later learn about. Yeah, so after she basically like shows up Celeborn, they Celeborn is like, why didn't we hear about this sooner, about the fall of Gandalf? And it's like, this happened yesterday. Like you couldn't have possibly (laughs) heard it heard about it any sooner before then. Like Honestly, in the time of like they don't like they don't have cell phones or anything like they can't tweet about it. So in the time of like news being sent, you know, physically by mail or in person, I think, you know, 24 to 48 hours later is like pretty fast in terms of finding out that Gandalf died. Yeah. But yeah, I just already much like Gimli. I was like, I like this one. (laughs) I mm-hmm. like collateral. They decide or they give the fellowship shelter and say, you are welcome to stay here. Obviously, we can tell that you are very, you know, they're phys- they're physically in pain because they've been traveling so long. Some of them have injuries. And then they're also grieving for Gandalf. And I mean, like also like just aside from this whole like ominous quest of going to Mordor to destroy this evil ring that Sauron wants like that's already a pretty heavy burden and then like on top of that is the death of Gandalf she kind of ends this ends her they're like welcome but by saying like kind of the most obvious thing ever and then also it's that like classic not like non-advice that the elves give um, mm-hmm. That we were introduced to, I think in like chapter four in the very beginning of the book or something. She says, but this I will say to you, your quest stands upon the edge of a knife. Stray but a little and it will fail to the ruin of all. Yet hope remains while all the company is true. So I, don't know, I just like that. <laughs> like stray but a little and it will fail to the ruin of all. It's like, yeah, we know that already. Thanks for <laughs> <laughs> the very unhelpful non-advice. I will say these elves do some very helpful things before they <laughs> before the company leaves Lothlorien. Like more so than a lot of the other elves that we've seen. They yeah. don't like they do give a lot of vague words, but then they do actually mm-hmm. do some physical things that actually help. And yeah. Like, yeah, so which, I do like that about them. Yeah, and Sam yeah, Sam says something about that later too. So and then she like stares them all like she sta- looks at them all in the eye like individually and basically like stares into their soul and I love mm-hmm. that she has like such a fierce gaze and with that word she held them with her eyes and in silence looked searchingly in each of them in turn none save Legolas and Aragorn could long endure her glance Sam quickly blushed and hung his head um, so she sends them off and says go rest And when they all kind of group up together, they talk about like what that was and what happened. And basically Mm -hmm. everyone experienced this same feeling of like, she's staring into my brain and she can see like what I, it's almost like a, 
um, if like the mirror of Erised from Harry Potter was like in her eyes where like she's looking at them and she's seeing like what they're thinking about, what they would rather be doing or what they want rather than being on this long perilous quest. Right. (laughs) They're all, yeah, so they all say, so Sam I think is the only one who actually shares with the group what he was thinking about. And he says, she seemed to be looking inside me and asking me what I would do if she gave me the chance of flying back home to the Shire to a nice little hole with with a bit of my with a bit of garden of my own. And then Mary says, yeah, I felt the same thing. And then they just kind of like the entire group is like, yeah, I've, I thought something similar, but I'm not going to say what I was thinking about. And I don't know, that's just so it's I guess it just shows the I don't know, the I don't want to say like power of Galadriel because that feels negative or mm-hmm. I don't know but like she's she de- like she obviously has a lot it's almost like she has like power but with the power is grace I guess I don't know a graceful yeah. power that's that's a good way of putting it um I, oh sorry go ahead I, I don't know it's hard to say because she is so old and she has seen mm-hmm so much mm-hmm. and i yeah i i don't know if i have anything else to say about that just it's an interesting i like how you put that the power with the grace yeah like she's not gonna you you have this feeling that like she's not gonna abuse this power so they well, s- oh uh oh <laughs> i don't know i i get more that she's all, she's past her years of abusing power oh, okay and then oh and it's funny yeah so yeah boromir is saying like i'm not sure about this woman and then Aragorn gets real defensive and says, Speak no evil of the Lady Galadriel. You know not what you say. There is in her and in this land no evil unless a man bring it hither himself. So I love that he just like goes off, which mm-hmm. I have my own. I'm kind of like slowly picking up on hints and I'm hoping this is what it is. But from the time that Aragorn, t- when they're like camping out at Weathertop, he tells the story of... Baron, Baron and Luthien? And, yes, and Luthien. Um, about mm-hmm. the elf who falls in love with the mortal, and then the mortal man dies, and then she gives up her immortality to die along with him. And then there are just all these hints about, like, so I've just been waiting for whatever elf woman it is that Aragorn is in love with um, to pop up. And I'm assuming it's Galadriel, because in the previous chapter, when they finally make it, they the hobbits had been like up in the trees looking at something and then they come down and they notice that like Aragorn is daydreaming and it looks like he's just totally lost in his thoughts and he's like thinking of like beautiful wonderful old times and he says and he says that like my heart lives here previously it mentioned that the only people who could stand Galadriel's gaze were Aragorn and Legolas And obviously Legolas, I think, could because he is also an elf. So and then he gets really defensive about her here. So I'm just sticking with this theory whether and side note, I should also add that you are by no means obligated to respond to like any of the bold claims I make if you think it's going to like give something away. (laughs) Um, I I think that's really interesting. Cool. (laughs) On a completely different note, uh, just to sort of tie things together, I will say that the Elvish king who had the Neglamir with the Silmaril and the necklace, Mm -hmm. he was the father of Luthien. Oh. And the whole Silmaril thing got involved because he really didn't want his daughter to marry this human man and die. Hmm. So that's why I'm not. Yeah. (laughs) I would be stroking my chin right now if I had a beard. (laughs) Cool. Well, actually, I think my previous prediction was that Aragorn is in love with Arwen because she is the, it mentions, like, the way he describes her is that it's like Luthien was walking the earth again. Mm -hmm. Because, and then we also find out that Luthien was like her like great-grandmother or something. Um, yeah, but Galadriel is her actual grandmother. Is she it? Oh, okay. There yeah. we go. Oh, um, I did her, not know so, that. So, yeah, Arwen's mother oh, okay. was Galadriel and Celeborn's daughter. Got it, got it. Anyway, so that's just like my bold claim for the episode is that Aragorn gotcha. is in love with Galadriel, but they can't be together. So <laughs> they stay in Lothlorien for several days and uh, once again, they like don't know exactly how many days because they are enjoying the, or not enjoying themselves. They are in such a state of like calm and being able to rest and 
heal themselves, that they aren't keeping track of the days or anything. Uh, and that happened before when they were in Rivendell after the council, but before they left for the journey, it was like, many days have passed, but we don't know how many, just let's say several months. <laughs> and I, once it, like, just once again, Tolkien with these descriptions, the air was cool and soft as if it were early spring, yet they felt about them the deep and thoughtful quiet of winter. It seemed to them that they did little but eat and drink and rest and walk among the trees, and it was enough. I mean, that sounds like a perfect day to yeah. me, so. <laughs> that sounds really good. That's not, like, exactly what I would just like to do if I can ever afford to take a vacation anywhere. Eat, drink. Walk around the trees. And it was enough. Man, I love that. While they're there, the other elves, the elves that are there, they can hear these songs of grief and mourning. And they know that they're about Gandalf because every now and then they'll hear, while they don't understand exactly what they're saying and they're not familiar with these songs because they're, they're singing or speaking in the elvish language, they do every now and then hear like Gandalf's name or references to his name. So they know that this is a lot that has also hit the elves pretty hard too. I don't understand this bit because Aragorn and Frodo speak elvish. I don't think... I think Aragorn was, has spent a lot of time in Lothlorien. I think it was my understanding that Frodo knows a couple, uh, a little bit of the elvish language just from what Bilbo has taught him from his journeys. So like mm -hmm. he knows enough... So in the beginning of the book, when the elves stumble upon, I think it's Sam, Pippin, and Frodo at that point. Um, yeah. And the elves, st they stumble upon the elves or whatever, and they the elves stop and help them or stay with them because Frodo greets them with an elf in their elvish language. Um, mm -hmm. So... I think it was my understanding that like he knows enough to kind of be respectful, kind of in the sense of they say that like when you're when you go uh, traveling to somewhere in Europe or mm -hmm. I don't know, it might also be other countries as well. But like as an American or an English speaker, one of the like best phrases you can learn. So like, let's say you're going to France. One of the best things for you to learn is to say do you speak English in French? Right. Because it's a little bit more respectful to say that rather than just going up to someone in France and going, do you speak English? Because they're right away, there's that assumption that yes, they do speak English because if they do speak English, they'll understand what you're saying. So I think he, I don't know about Aragorn. Maybe Aragorn does know what they're talking about. Let me see. Yeah, I don't know how much uh, Aragorn knows though, but... A Aragorn is fluent in Sindarin at least. Maybe Maybe, 100%. maybe it's like and the I, difference between like you speak Spanish really well, but like going to Spain and being completely immersed in it is a totally different experience. I guess. And there is a chance that they're singing in Quenya, which is the other elf mm -hmm. language. But I don't think they are because ever so slight spoiler here, Galadriel is going to sing a song in Quenya in the next chapter. <laughs> And um and Tolkien like makes a note of saying like she's using the old elvish tongue that nobody hears anymore. Hmm. So, so yeah. I, I don't see why Aragorn at the very least wouldn't like translate or tell them about yeah. it. Or or at least a mention that he knows what they're saying too. And I don't know. It's yeah. just weird to me. I don't know. Maybe he's grieving grieving on his own in his own way. Maybe. And he just wants to sit in thought rather than having to like translate or talk to the fellowship and tell them what's going on. So in the also in this period of time, Legolas is usually he doesn't spend a lot of the day with uh, everyone and he'll go out and be with the other elves. And it mentioned it says often he took Gimli with him when he went abroad in the land and the others wondered at this change. And I love that because it's like a sign. It's it, that is a huge sign of like they're going to be best friends now. Or I don't yes. know about that. But like, no. Nope. Yep. Yes. Yes. <laughs> best friends. Just the like bro ship is real. <laughs> Just like that alone is a huge sign that. Like in the previous chapter and earlier in this chapter, they make these like apolo 
apologies and official statements and like peace offerings and stuff. And it's one thing to like say those things, but it's another to actually show that you have put your differences aside and you are now willing to come together and for Legolas to do that and... And also it's, you know, just because Galadriel and Celeborn say we're putting all of our differences aside and we're going to move forward into a new era of peace and friendship between the dwarves and the elves, just because they say that doesn't mean the other elves who are in Lorien don't, you know, agree with that necessarily. So the fact that Legolas is taking Gimli around hopefully can also show the other elves around that like no this is this sign of peace and everything it's for real this is happening get used to it i the the best friendship between legolas and gimli is one of my favorite things in this in these books so it only gets better (laughs) yeah i was gonna say i'm really excited to see it because i've seen a lot of like memes or like jokes about how they're friends or whatever so Mm -hmm. i'm glad to see that friendship happening now We see a lot of like great kind of like character development in this chapter. So the first is between the elves and between specifically like with Legolas and Gimli. And like that's how that's how you do good character development Um, Mm -hmm. is showing it like piece by piece coming together. And then the other one is Sam. uh, Frodo asks him about what do you think of the elves? Because when they first set out or when they were about to set out, the thing that Sam was most excited for was to see elves Mm -hmm. and sam says i reckon there's elves and elves they're all elvish enough but they're not all the same like that should i mean it should also shows like how much sam has been through for him to realize that like oh they're not just like these otherworldly creatures that i don't know about and i'm imagining or anything they're an actual people and they are just like the hobbits in the sense that the you know not all the hobbits are same are the same and mm-hmm. not all the elves are the same i think that's one of the most like sam is a stand in for the reader moments in the whole series Mm -hmm. because I would probably think the same way if I was suddenly thrust into a fantastical setting like yes show me the elves yes bring me (laughs) to the elves right now Exactly. <laughs> and um some Rivendell and some magic, please and thank um, you. And it's funny though, because Sam Sam also yeah, so he talks about the magic too, and he says, It's wonderfully quiet here, nothing seems to be going on, and nobody seems to want it to. If there's any magic about, it's right down deep where I can't lay my hands on it in a manner of speaking. And then Frodo says, You can see and feel it everywhere. And basically, yeah, so they talk about the elf magic and stuff, and Sam is like, I mean, I'd kind of like to see some. You know, I I guess it's enough to, you know, just be here and be feeling it. And as they're talking about that, Lady Gladriel shows up and is like, oh, so I hear you want to see some elf magic, huh? (laughs) She's so great. Oh my gosh, I love it. So she takes them... Uh, with her to the river and she fills this basin with water and breathes on it and she says here is the mirror of Galadriel I've brought you here so that you may look in it if you will this is just like a really cool like I don't even know like it's a really cool piece of magic I guess kind of going back to like her graceful power whereas Mm -hmm. like this is a very whatever the mirror is going to show it like it's a very powerful thing but it's also I don't know, like, it's just, it's really tricky because it's just for, like, my Harry Potter-oriented brain. It's almost as if the mirror is, like, the mirror of Erised and, like, a Boggart combined. How it will show you, it can show you, like, what you want to see. It can show you what you fear the most. It, like, reads your brain almost to, like, show you whatever it is that, it is that you need to be seeing i guess i don't know i get the one thing with like the mirror of erised and a bogart they have very specific things that they do like one will show you what you want and one will show you what you fear the mirror you don't know Mm -hmm. what it's showing you exactly or the mirror of galadriel i should specify yes like it could be one of those two things but it could be something else entirely yeah it doesn't doesn't seem to have any or at least nobody knows what its motivations are It's just very, yeah, it's just very, like, specific to whatever. I guess it, like, shows you whatever, maybe you, maybe it is that, like, you need you need to see whether or not you know that you need to see it, I guess, if that makes sense. I don't know. 
Yeah. Galadriel is basically as helpful as I am right now in describing what it can what it can show. And she kind of sounds like a like a bad tarot card reader. She says for it shows things that were and things that are and things that yet may be. Once again, it can basically show anything and you just don't know it until you look at it. <laughs> so much of this scene is almost word for word in the movie. And it's so strange to hear the lines read out loud by somebody who isn't Kate Blanchett. <laughs> I'm sorry, listeners. <laughs> maybe it's I'll not get bad. Her, maybe it's I'll just, get her on the pod and <laughs> yeah. have her just read out these lines. Well, it's also, I guess, so I haven't, I've only watched the first movie one time and I don't remember it very well, but I definitely remember like how epic the you shall not pass line is. And then in the book, it's literally you cannot pass. And so it (laughs) it was very jarring. I imagine hearing me read for it shows things that were and things that are and things that yet may be. That must sound as weird to you as reading you cannot pass was to me. So reading you cannot pass is weird to me, too, because I've seen the movie a lot also. And also like at the beginning of the fellowship in the book, I think Gandalf says, keep it safe, keep it secret. But in the movie, it's very much keep it secret, keep it safe or whatever mm-hmm. it's the opposite and the movie line i quote all the time about the stupidest thing <laughs> you know like i'll just give somebody something and say keep it secret keep it safe and so having it be the opposite in the book was like i can't i can't even read this this is so wrong <laughs> somewhat so i posted a meme about gandalf like not telling frodo how to destroy the ring and i posted this meme and You know, memes are silly and like kind of what we were talking about earlier about like there are definitely some Lord of the Rings fans who take themselves too seriously. And someone commented on it and said like, that's not even how it happens. Gandalf clearly told Frodo to go meet him at the Prancing Pony. And it said something like, this meme is dumb. Keep it secret. (laughs) And I, (laughs) I replied and was like, well, that's not at all what happened in the book. Maybe you should read it sometime. So I was like, ooh, burn. Because <laughs> I don't, apparently, it ha- the way that that all happens is very different in the movie, but I don't remember about it. But, like, anyway, <laughs> I, gu- yeah. I guess I didn't make the connection. I was like, what a weird thing to say to someone who doesn't like your meat, like, keep it secret. Like, what a weird hate comment. And then I guess now I'm making the connection keep it safe, keep it secret. <laughs> so, <laughs> haters gonna hate, whatever. You keep it secret, keep it safe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whichever you want. I guess that's kind of like whichever one you say, it's kind of like the test of like what first comes to mind when you say, when you hear someone say, hey, now. For me, the first thing that comes to mind is, hey, now, hey, now, this is what dreams are made of. And then for some people, it's. Wait, do you, it's, this is from the, that's from the Lizzie McGuire movie. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my gosh. Have you not seen, it's a masterpiece. Um, no, I'm just okay. kidding. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and then some people think of, when they hear Hey Now, they think of, hey now, you're a rock star or an all star or whatever. You're an all star. All star, there we go. So. <laughs> So I guess you could tell a lot about a person by whether they say keep it safe, keep it secret, or keep it secret, keep it safe. <laughs> Anywho, God, I don't even remember what you're talking about. Uh, um, glad oh, drill in the mirror. That's right. <laughs> what the chapter is named for. <laughs> yeah. So Sam is like, okay, I'll look at it. Why not? Well, first, he thinks that he he just wants to see what's going on in the Shire, and he wants to know what's happening back home, and, which, I, you know, is understandable. It's the only world that he's ever known up until now, and he misses it a lot. Um, he looks in it, and everything looks pretty normal, and then it just kind of slowly fades into this very dark vision or, you know, whatever, whether it's currently happening, already has happened, or will happen. We don't know, but it just shows like the Shire being attacked, like trees are being knocked over and falling down. His dad is being like kicked out of his house. And it, oh, also, once again, they bring up someone named Ted Sandy Man. Who is Ted Sandy (laughs) Man? They bring him up in the previous chapter when, or not the previous, uh, yes. No, I'm getting everything confused. They bring him up. A previous chapter. (laughs) At some point, previously, they say that, like, 
Sam had the fire of Ted Sandy Man in his eyes. And I'm like, who is Ted Sandy Man? And then here he is again. Is this like a character from The Hobbit? Uh, I don't think so. He, oh he is a Hobbit. You, uh, I, I can't explain who he is without spoilers. Oh, gee. Oh, gosh. That's so funny. Okay. So we find out we learn more about Ted Sandy Man. Great. For me, I don't know. It's just so funny because like Ted Sandy Man has unintentionally become like what Tom Bombadil is to the Lord of the Rings fandom. Sandy Man is to me personally. Or Ted Sandy Man. I'm, I'm like, who are you? I can't wait to I mean, <laughs> find out about Tom, you. Tom Bombadil is obviously the next Dark Lord, but... <laughs> Oh, Tom Bombadil, man. So anyway, t- yeah, uh, Sam jumps back and is like, that's messed up. We have to go home immediately. And Galadriel says, I know that you are not going to go home without Frodo. Does she say, yeah, once again says your master, which I still don't like that this relationship that they they connect Frodo and Sam with, that Frodo is Sam's master, just feels very ugh to me. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't get better. Oh, jeez. Anyway, so yeah, Galadriel's like, I know you're not going to go home without Frodo. Frodo, would you like to look in the mirror and I guess use that to help make a decision or something? And Frodo is... so. She, he asks, like, do you think I should look in the mirror? Or wait, no, does he say that? Yeah, she sa- he says, do you advise me to look? And then once again, with the classic elfish mm-hmm. non-advice, no, I do not counsel you one way or the other. I am not a counselor. Um, basically says, like, you might learn some things that will help you and you might not learn things that will help you. But she does say, I think that you are smart enough and brave enough to to do this for yourself. So he looks in it and he sees a vision of a man, a figure, and it says, suddenly Frodo realized that it reminded him of Gandalf. He almost called aloud the wizard's name and then he saw that the figure was clothed not in gray, but in white, in a white that shone faintly in the dusk and in its hand there was a white staff so way to spoil your own book tolkien because <laughs> like if i hadn't and frodo like later says oh is this gandalf from the past or is this showing saruman so frodo isn't even thinking about the possibility that gandalf is going to come back as gandalf the white but like uh, tolkien is so not subtle in his foreshadowing at all so I was just kind of like, well, if I like didn't previously know that Gandalf comes back as Gandalf the White, I think I would figure it out right about here <laughs> or at least have a good a good idea. I, one thing to keep in mind, I guess, is that Tolkien wrote these three books as one book mm-hmm. and then and they were all published within like five months of each other or so something something really close together that would never happen these days. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't necessarily trying to keep it secret. I guess that's true. Yeah. And also kind of like, I think our brain, like our brains nowadays, I think are used to being like, okay, look around for those extra clues, look around for those bits of foreshadowing to see what's going to happen in the future. And I feel like that wasn't as much of a maybe wasn't as much of a thing when he was or wasn't as common or as well known to audiences back then when this came out. Yeah, and it may not have been something he cared about at all. (laughs) He was just like, I'm gonna write what I want. And if you figure it out, great. If not, who cares? Yeah, I need <laughs> I need to tell people all of Gandalf's names, so obviously he has to come back to life. So <laughs> True. And the, so then Frodo, the vision kind of shifts and he sees, it says the C with a capital S. So I'm assuming there's a, a big, great ocean or sea that is very, that's going to come into play at some kind of battle or something in the future. And it's very like dark and stormy. There are ships like with black sails and a fortress with seven towers. There's fire and a battle going on and all this is happening. And then it shifts again into, it goes blank and it's completely black for, and Frodo's like, oh, okay, so I guess that's over. It's it's done. But it's slowly out of like the darkness. In the black abyss, there appeared a single eye that slowly grew until it filled nearly all the mirror. So terrible was it that Frodo stood rooted, unable to cry out or to withdraw his gaze. The eye was rimmed with fire, but itself glazed yellow as a cat's. 
watchful and intent, and the black slit of its pupil opened on a pit, a window into nothing. Ugh, gross. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And Frodo is like slowly kind of like moving closer towards it, and Gladriel is like, don't touch the water, and kind of snaps him out of it, and he jumps back, and he's like, that's messed up. (laughs) And Gladriel is like, I saw what you saw. I under, like, I know what it was that you were seeing because we too here have been touched by this darkness. And she says, but do not do not think that only by singing amid the trees, nor even in the slender arrows of elven bows, is this land of Lothlorien maintained and defended against its evil or its enemy. Sorry. And what's funny is that in the previous chapter, what is the previous chapter? In the previous chapter of Lothlorien, I was like, wow, this place is so magical. It just seems like such a safe, nice little bubble that hasn't even like been touched by the darkness at all. And it's the last safe place. And then here it is, her being like, I know that it may seem like everything is fine and safe and good here, but we too have seen darkness here. So I like mm-hmm. being I like being proven wrong less than like a chapter later. So <laughs> and then is this big reveal that my big dumb brain took forever to figure out. So <laughs> she is talking about so she says that like we've been touched by darkness too and she holds her hand up and it kind of glimmers in the starlight it glittered like polished gold overlaid with silver light and a white stone in it twinkled as if the even star had come down to rest upon her hand and then she says yes it is not permitted to speak of it, and Elrond could not do so, but it cannot be hidden from the ring bearer and one who has seen the eye. Verily, it is in the land of Lorien, upon the finger of Galadriel, that one of the three remains. This is Nenya, the ring of the adamant, and I am its keeper. And my dumb brain was like, oh, Tolkien's trying to draw attention to the fact that she's wearing a wedding ring and she's married, which (laughs) means that Aragorn can't be with her. (laughs) 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 And then, like, as it says, Frodo gazed at the ring with awe for suddenly it seemed to him that he understood. And I was like, wait, what is Frodo understanding? I don't get it. And then it wasn't until like the very, the the ring of the adamant, I am its keeper, that I was like, oh, this is one of the three elfish rings. Got it. (laughs) Do you, do you have any guesses as to who has the other two? I feel like, I feel like Elrond, maybe. And then... I'm trying to think of like where I feel like the other one has to be. I feel like it would be dumb to have them all in the same place. Mm -hmm. So I feel like the other one is somewhere that I don't know about yet or with someone I haven't met yet. Maybe it's with Legolas's dad. Who knows? Who is his dad? Starts with a TH. Thranduil. Yes. Maybe it's with him. I don't because he because he that seems to be a very respected elf. The way that they talk about him or the way that they talk about Legolas in reference to him, I guess. I don't know. So okay. that's my prediction. And so, it, yeah, so <laughs> here it is. Ta-da, the ring. But as soon as I re- as soon as I was like, oh, that's that's the Elvish ring. Cool. And then I was like, wait a minute. That's really lit. Galadriel has one of the rings. That's dope. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like that would be something that you don't... uh, Could very easily be written that like Celeborn has it instead of her. Oh no, Galadriel is way more important than Celeborn. Yeah, which I love. (laughs) Like in so many ways, she's way more important. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Which Yeah, so which Frodo agrees with that she is a very important person and basically says like, oh, cool. Well, um, can you take my ring? Because <laughs> it seems like you would do a better job of handling this situation than I can. Galadriel talks about kind of like thinks about the one ring and taking it and what it would mean for her to wear it and have it. And she basically just has like this law. Lo- it's like this long monologue where she's kind of just talking to herself. Mm -hmm. She says, I shall not be dark, but beautiful and terrible as the morning and the night. Fair as the sea and the sun and the snow upon the mountain. Dreadful as the storm and the lightning. Stronger than the foundations of the earth. 
all shall love me and despair. She looks at the ring a little bit longer and then looks back at Frodo and then like laughs to herself. And then she says, I passed the test. I will diminish and go into the West and remain Galadriel. So I was like, okay, that was a interesting. It's like she talked herself into taking the ring and then back out of it again within the span of this like two paragraphs. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like, I guess throughout the books, you see different people and how how they react to the temptation of the ring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was that was her being tempted to take it and become yeah. a dark queen. Yes. Which I am all for. Yes. Oh my god. Really? I I literally that's my last note on this chapter is I mean I would be so anyway. So basically, she's like, No, I can't, I I can't take the ring because then I would just turn into the next Sauron and it wouldn't be good. Um, it's kind of this catch 22 for the elves of like, if Frodo, if you fail in your mission, our rings will be taken and will be like lost to us, basically. And if you succeed in your mission, the power of our rings will be no more. And Mm -hmm. it's, they're basically in a lose-lose situation, but obviously they would rather lose the power and have them just be pieces of metal or whatever than be under the control of Sauron. So yeah, anyway, and so (laughs) they're talking about leaving on their net, like for the next part of their journey. And it was at this point that I was like, oh man, we're only going to have Galadriel for like four more pages, aren't we? And then they're going to leave and we're not going to have her anymore. So I got sad about that. (laughs) I hope that they take her with them but i'm getting the impression that she's gonna be like no i'm better i'm more useful here or i'm needed here or something i don't know but anyway yeah my last note of the chapter is like i i think i would be okay if galadriel was wearing the one ring like that's a risk i'm willing to take yes me too I, I like when Sam near the end says, I think you should take it. You would just put everything right. And she's like, yeah, that's how it would start. <laughs> and then it would just go downhill I, I, from I, there. <laughs> yeah, I just, I identify with that line so much. You know, like, <laughs> yes, give me the power. I will fix everything. Mm-hmm. Oh, and it's funny because it ends with Sam saying that. But it's funny because she was asking him, like, did you not recognize the ring upon my finger? Did you see the ring? And in that moment, I am Sam. Because it says, no, lady, to tell you the truth. I wondered what you were talking about. So <laughs> that was me being like, oh, Tolkien's trying to like make it super obvious that she's married and she has a wedding ring on, which I don't even know if the elves have like traditional wedding rings or whatever. But anyway, that's how the chapter ends. What did you think of that chapter? Any random thoughts or anything that we didn't get to talk about? Well, you, we did skip over Frodo's song. Oh, shoot, we did. For for Gandalf, which is very nice. And it's it's good. I like it a lot. But what I actually like is Sam's add on to it about the fireworks and his use of the phrase golden showers, (laughs) which (laughs) I didn't even read that. Oh, God. I mean, I read it, but I don't think I registered it. Oh, gosh. Yeah, you're right. So that was my B. We definitely skipped over that. Yeah, so in their process of mourning and listening to the songs, Frodo creates this own song about Gandalf and grieving and stuff. And then Sam, yeah, Sam says, you'll be beating Mr. Bilbo next. And Sam, uh, Frodo is like, uh, probably not, but that's the best I can do. And I'm like, Frodo, you just made like an entire song that rhymes. Like I can barely rhyme like two phrases next to each other. Yeah. And so they're talking about, yeah, they're talking about the song and I'll read the full thing. Sam adds, the finest rockets ever seen, they burst in stars of blue and green. And after thunder, golden showers came falling like a rain of flowers. So did not even register that. Again, just the context of that was written many, many years ago. And we are in the year 2019. (laughs) We made a lot of jokes about this on our show. And my co-host, Rachel, definitely almost the second we were done, put the movie on to check. Sam does this bit in the movie and they definitely changed it to silver showers. Oh, that's so funny. (laughs) Oh, that's great. That's great. I'm so glad you pointed we you went back to point this out because I yeah. would not have noticed it at all. So <laughs> we may have spent our whole episode just on golden showers. That's really funny. Uh, another thing, have you? Like, I guess Gladriel briefly mentions Arendelle in this. Has that name come up before? Um, 
Oh, did she mention it? I'm sure she, she did. Or the, the star of Arendelle glints off the ring or something like that. So here's the thing. I feel like a bad student because I mm-hmm. know that that has definitely been mentioned and talked about and discussed, but I don't remember in what context or what it okay. is or who it is. Arendelle is just like a important figure in... Well, see, here's the thing that I both hate and love about the Silmarillion, in that in one way you're reading it and it's like, oh, these are like the elves' myths and legends about how the world came to be the way it is. But also people that are alive in the Lord of the Rings are in these stories. So actually, mm-hmm. these all really happened. It's a it's a weird thing. Yeah, it's like, so, it's like the equivalent of like, if, oh my God, why can I not remember any characters or people from the Bible. God, in my brain. Well, I'm more liking it to something like um, Hades and Persephone. Like, here's a story about Mm -hmm. why we have spring and winter and all that sort of thing. Yeah. But also, Persephone's my mom. Yeah. You know, so it's like, "Mm." Yeah. (laughs) But anyways, Arendelle is the the brightest star in the sky, like the the morning and the evening star, which is, you know, hundreds of years later is the planet Venus. But... (laughs) But like all those things aside, he's also Elrond's dad. That's yeah, that's how it that's it. That's how I know the name. <laughs> well, anyway, so that brings us to a close. Caitlin, what would you like to plug? Where can people find you on the internet? Okay, a lot of places, I suppose. I do have my own Tolkien podcast. So you want to read Tolkien where uh, me and two friends, Rachel and Emmy are reading all through the books. So we started with the Silmarillion and then we did the Hobbit. And now we're on we're on the two towers right now. Our goal with the Silmarillion at the very least was to talk about it in a way and we're like if you didn't want to read the Silmarillion but you wanted all the knowledge you could listen to our podcast and hopefully get it in a fun and entering entertaining way so we're on twitter at to read tolkien or want to read tolkien.com or you want to read tolkien.com i think is our website and you can find everything there and i also am doing a historic materials podcast right now uh called measures of truth and you can find us on twitter at mot pod so you can find me on twitter usually i'm at inferior caitlin but for the month of October, I have changed it to at Superior Caitlin as like my Halloween costume. So that's me on Twitter. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah, right now my name on Twitter is Scary Clay instead of Mary Clay. And then I have like nice. all of the Halloween emojis you could think of. <laughs> yeah, most people do just change their display name, but I actually changed my Your my handle, at. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I guess if I get stuck with Superior Caitlin, that's not like the worst thing I was going to say, it's a pretty good handle to have. Yeah. yeah. I'm in the process. I really want to change my Twitter handle, but I don't know what to change it to that also is available. So. Right. Ugh. Mine was great because I have a, a good friend who's also named Caitlin and we spell our names the same way, which is rare among Caitlins. Mm-hmm. And so calling myself Inferior Caitlin it was really just to make her feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I love that. That's great. (laughs) Cool. That's What I'm Talking About is a production of Bacon and Eggs. You can learn more about them by going to baconandeggs.media. The cover art is by Graphite, aka Vaishan Brandon. Support him on Instagram at graphite.vmb. You can find the podcast on Twitter and Instagram at Tolkien About Pod. You can find me on Twitter at mcwatt416 and Instagram at mcturndownforwatt. And if you're listening and you like this, please rate and review. That would be very kind of you, and it would just make me happy. So (laughs) with that being said, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, Just thanks for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was very fun. Thanks so much. And I can't wait until I'm, like, done reading, and then I can, like, kind of reread and listen to y'all's episodes about the chapters. (laughs) Which are a mess. Yay. (laughs) And that's what I'm talking about. (laughs) 